Yeah, those of you who've read the essay I contributed to Victoria Gitman's catalog will know that my approach to her art in that essay was based on an extremely close focus. Uh, basically, the essay is about my exchange of a single painting, this one here. And moreover, my reading of the painting hangs on one very tiny detail of it, which uh, you can't, I don't know if you can really see there. Um, a very tiny uh, detail of it, namely the rendering of the clasp of the purse, which if you look closely enough, and enough in this case means very closely indeed, uh, functions as a convex mirror in which what must be the reflection of the painter occurs as a sort of pinprick of color. Um, so yeah, if you look up at the one on the left, you maybe can see that there's a little dot there. And so that dot has to be the, uh, the self-portrait of uh, Victoria Gitman. Uh, well, Gitman's art lends itself to very close and very long looking. You won't find very many painters today who render the surfaces of things seen in such fine detail. And among those few, there are many fewer, many fewer still who manage to do so while also rendering the mercurial life of the eye that grazes, if that's the right word, among this infinitesimal visual abundance of things. With most painters, such intense detail becomes hard, glassy, lifeless, airless. Not so in Gitman's case. Her paintings breathe at every level. So in thinking about how to talk about Gitman's work today without repeating myself, I thought I'd better stay away from that kind of close focus. In fact, it occurred to me to do the opposite to pull the camera back and take in the widest possible view. As in a movie where one suddenly sees the protagonist from above in a kind of God's eye view as a tiny figure in a vast landscape. Or maybe another way to describe it would be to say that I intend to approach Gitman's work slowly in the manner of one of those old fashioned novelists who spend hundreds of pages acquainting the reader with the protagonist's ancestry and perhaps even with the geo-historical development of the landscape in which the protagonist will live and act before our hero is even born. I seem to remember that Thomas Wolfe's Look Homeward Angel was something like that. In this case, I'm going to begin my novel, which is a story about observation and painting, as long ago as the late 19th century, when, well before the advent of abstraction, the idea of representation began to seem problematic to a number of important artists. Through most of the 19th century, it was impossible to imagine painting without a model taken from the empirical world, a motif, no matter how wildly the model might be transformed in the process. Both on plein air and in the studio, the painter's task always involved an encounter with people or things. This was an art founded in, represent, in observation. But the encounter could be transformative. Speaking of the artists of the 19th century, the art historian Jacques uh, Letev remarked that even if they almost always needed to refer to models, whether living models or objects, in carrying out their works, yet in the last resort, they used them in order to transform them. They might turn a poor girl hired for five francs an hour into a queen of the East, or immortalize a basket of flowers or a pewter jug. So art could change what it observed, usually by idealizing it. Sometimes, if the narrator of Marcel Proust's In Search of Lost Time is to be believed, the metamorphosis could go in the reverse direction, not ennobling the source, but rendering it more quotidian. Uh, and here's a, a quote from, from his great novel. In this connection, a cousin of the Princess of Luxembourg a woman of great beauty and arrogance, having taken a fancy to a form of art that was new at the time, commissioned a portrait of herself from the most prominent of the painters of the naturalist school. The artist's eye had instantly detected what it saw everywhere. On the completed canvas, instead of the grand lady, there was the dressmaker's errand girl. In his story, The Real Thing, Henry James tells the ironic 
tale of an artist who hires a couple of down-on-their-luck aristocrats to pose for illustrations for a story of high, high society, only to discover their stubborn inability to transform even into their own likenesses, their incapacity to represent, even if just to represent their own kind, proving what James's narrator called the perverse and cruel law in virtue of which the real thing could be so much less precious than the unreal. Although James is not normally associated with the literary and artistic movement commonly known as symbolism, his narrator's preference for the unreal over the real reminds us that James was at least a contemporary of the symbolists and breathed something of the same atmosphere. In 1888, about four years before the publication of The Real Thing, Paul Gauguin, whose self-portrait you see here, gave one of his correspondents his own view on the superiority of the unreal over the real. He offered a piece of advice. Don't copy too closely from nature. Art is an abstraction. Bring it forth from nature by dreaming before her. No realist, no impressionist would ever have said such a thing. This was a new turn in the history of pictorial representation as it developed in the European 19th century. As the Swiss art historian Dario Gamboni explains in a fascinating new book on the artist, Gauguin's criticism of mimetic naturalism established an ambivalent relationship between the natural prototype, a relation forged in equal parts of presence and absence, of proximity and distance. I might also add that it partakes equally of perception and imperception, since to dream before nature, as Gauguin demands, seems to imply the closed and sightless eye of the sleeper, even though the stimulus of nature is somehow still there. It's as if the artist's closed or at least lowered eyelids were not opaque, but served to filter out the aspects of reality irrelevant to his art. Gamboni points to a passage from Edgar Allan Poe that Gauguin transcribed into one of his writings. Poe wrote, we can at any time double the true beauty of an actual landscape by half closing our eyes as we look at it. The naked senses sometimes see too little, but then always they see too much. Again, artistic vision, as opposed to its everyday cognate, is conceived of as a filter. Elsewhere, Gauguin refers lyrically and synesthetically to a listening eye, as though the organ of sight had other senses to feed than the one it is most obviously associated with. Abstraction, as Gauguin uses the term, is different from what it came to mean in the 20th century. It does not sever the relation with the object, with the model, with perceived nature, but distances it, filters it, and, I hope I am allowed to invent this word, synesthetizes it. Gamboni points out that in Gauguin's 1886 still life with Laval's portrait, the head, which is decontextualized by being cut off at the painting's edge, is hard to reconcile spatially with the still life. And it, it at once does and does not seem to represent the act of perceiving it. Though Laval's head is turned toward the, uh, toward the case, his, his, toward the vase, uh, Gamboni writes, his eyes are closed and he seems to meditate rather than gaze. Similarly, in the Yellow Christ of 1889, the peasant women neither gaze at their savior nor do they even have a vision of him. Instead, their pious awareness seems to exist on some other level altogether. In a late still life with exotic birds in the Pushkin Museum, painted in 1902, one might imagine that Gauguin was limiting himself to a much more empirical observation of the motif than one might have expected from earlier paintings like the Yellow Christ. And yet the statue or idol in the background, spatially detached from the still life and not given any determinate place in the decoration of the room, which is otherwise rendered simply a field of blue, calls attention again to the idea of the impercipient observer, thereby mirroring the kind of dreamy viewer that Gauguin imagined for his painting. A generation and a half later, Henri Matisse, too, was working with that ambivalent relationship between the natural prototype, a relation formed in equal parts of presence and absence of proximity and distance, to 
uh, requote uh, Gamboni uh, describing the work of Gauguin. What interests me is neither still not life nor landscape, wrote Matisse in his Notes of a Painter of 1908, the same year that this painting was painted, but the human figure. It is that which best permits me to express my, so to speak, religious feeling toward life. That's funny, that so to speak religious feeling that Matisse mentioned. In other words, a feeling that simultaneously is and isn't religious. In the original, le sentiment pour ainsi dire religieux que je possède de la vie. Sorry for my bad accent. Uh, I think he's talking about this spiritual side of reality that Gauguin called its abstraction. And it's funny because Matisse, the atheist who himself, who asked himself some three decades later in his 1947 book, Jazz, Si je crois en Dieu, if I believe in God, answered himself, oui, quand je travaille, yes, when I'm working. But the chapel he created in Vence starting around that time, it was completed in 1951, reflects a sense of religion completely worldly and alien to the church. It wasn't an entirely a joke when Matisse's friend, the communist poet and novelist Louis Aragon responded, very pretty, very gay. In fact, when we take over, we'll turn it into a dance hall. <laughs> Jack Flam conveys the painter's reply. Oh, no, you won't. I've already taken precautions. I have a formal agreement with the town of Vence that if the nuns are expropriated, the chapel will become a museum, a monument historique. So was Matisse uh, the devotee of a religion of art? Maybe. But it's hard to credit him when he depicts himself in the text for jazz as submissive and modest, his words, before nature. In 1908, he had declared his neutrality in the conflict between painting from nature and painting from the imagination. For him, a certain sort of illusion or self-deception is necessary to the artist. An artist must recognize when he is reasoning, Matisse wrote, that his picture is an artifice. But when he is painting, he should feel that he has copied nature. And even when he departs from nature, he must do it with the conviction that it is only to interpret her more strongly. And at the end of Matisse's life in 1954, he was still insisting that the essential expression of a work depends almost entirely on the projection of the feeling of the artist in relation to his model, rather than the organic exactitude of the model. And of course, in his late cutouts, the relationship to the model had become very tenuous. In other words, even, even as it had become possible to understand painting as entirely divorced or almost entirely divorced from any origin in the encounter with the model, whether or not the painting was abstract in the 20th century of, sense of the term rather than in Gauguin's sense, it's clear that whatever he may have said in his late paper cutouts, Matisse happily availed himself of this new autonomy from the model. And yet he was not willing to give up his idea that the origin of the work lay in its relation to a model, even if that relation was to be located in feeling and not in the exactitude of perception. As the 20th century went on, and despite the ever increasing weight of the tendency to cut loose from the model, a great many painters adhered to something like Gauguin and Matisse's idea of an ambiguous relation to the model, one mediated through the artist's subjectivity. Remarkable painters like Max Beckmann, Giorgio Morandi, Chaim Soutin, Alice Neal, Eugène Lois, to name just a few. But my subject this evening is what might be called the counter tendency to this great line of modernist painters. And so I'm going to uh, not say anything more about them. However, before I uh, move ahead, I do want to say a few words about one more of their number, Alberto Giacometti, because in his case, the ambivalence of the painter's relation to the model reached a level of intensity that became absurd, even comical, and yet, by the same token, heroic. Uh, I hope some of you have read James Lord's remarkable book on the experience of sitting for the Swiss artist. It's called A Giacometti Portrait, and if you haven't, 
I urge you to do it right away because it's one of the best books about any artist. As we learn from this very short book, Giacometti was convinced that it is impossible to achieve a likeness. So what's best is simply to look at people. And further, anyway, people themselves are the only real likenesses. That's an extraordinary thought. To what are people likenesses? Not to their portraits, apparently. Perhaps to themselves, but then that implies that the people are not themselves, but only semblances of themselves. The head swims. In any case, working as Giacometti's model convinces Lord that rather than the portrait as such, or even the painting as such, for the artist, in Lord's words, what meant something, what alone existed with a life of its own, was his indefatigable, indeter interminable struggle via the act of painting to express in visual terms a perception of reality that had happened to coincide momentarily with my head. To achieve this was, of course, impossible, Lord continued, because what is essentially abstract can never be made concrete without altering its essence. But he was committed, he was in fact condemned to the attempt, which at times seemed like the act of Sisyphus. One thinks perhaps of Tertullian's Credo Quia Absurdum, I believe because it is absurd. Giacometti discovers that the task of representing what he sees is inherently self-contradictory and redoubles his pursuit of the task for that very reason, because only the absurd, the impossible, is worth pursuing. To make a head really lifelike is impossible, Giacometti considers, and the more you struggle to make it lifelike, the less like life it will be. In Henry James's terms, the unreal is more precious than the real because it contains the possibility of illusion. And, as Giacometti believed, if you heighten the illusory quality, then you come closer to the effect of life. Recalling his youth, Giacometti told Lord, I suddenly realized that I could do nothing, and I wondered why. I wanted to work to find out why. That's what kept me working ever since. Moreover, the desire to find out why I can't simply reproduce what I see. So the point of his efforts was not really to succeed in representing something, but to seek, succeed in comprehending to the full his inability to represent. Giacometti might have been the most radical in his self-doubt in his quest to make an art out of the impossibility of representation, but he was hardly the only one. And of course, not all of those felt the urgency of this uh, impossibility, experienced it through the representation of the model as he did. The American abstract expressionists too understood this, this feeling, even though when they painted figurative, figuratively or quasi-figuratively, as Willem de Kooning sometimes did, or even Jackson Pollock, and uh, this painting, uh, the title of this painting, A Portrait in a Dream, uh, recalls exactly Gauguin's uh, duality between uh, the representation of nature and dreaming in front of it. But in any case, with these kind of painters, it was by way of memory and imagination and not direct perception. That was the 1950s. But by the next decade, doubt had started, somehow started to seem less interesting to new artists. Doubt had come to seem a mannerism. Impossibility had become an alibi. Pop artists, minimalists, and conceptual artists, among others, followed a different path. As Saul LeWitt wrote in his Sentences on Conceptual Art in 1969, irrational thoughts should be followed absolutely and logically. And therefore, if the artist changes his mind midway through the execution of the piece, he compromises the result and repeats past results. Furthermore, LeWitt continued, once the idea of the piece is established in the artist's mind and the final form is decided, the process is carried out blindly and the process is mechanical and should not be tampered with. It should run its course. These are ideas that would have been rejected out of hand by Gauguin and Matisse, by Giacometti, or by Pollock and de Kooning. But they were ideas that were right for Lewitt's time because art was coming to know impossibility too well. 
making the gap between thought and expression, I borrow the phrase from Lou Reed, a place of indulgence. And the minimalists, pop artists, and conceptualists were hardly the only ones who felt this way. In the early 1960s, there also arose a number of representational painters who aimed to eliminate from their work the ambiguity and doubt that had been common to figurative painting and also to much abstraction for more than half a century. They were looking for a way to give this kind of painting a process that, like Lewitt's conceptualism, would involve a mechanical process not to be tampered with. Many of them became known as photorealists, but a few of them determined to work without recourse to photography and directly in front of the model. Probably the most interesting of these was Philip Perlstein. His often very strange paintings attempt to account for everything that is empirically observable in a scene he sets up in his studio, which you might say functions like a laboratory where this experiment can take place without hindrance, and to consciously admit nothing that is not empirically observable. Just the facts, ma'am. From Giacometti to Perlstein is a long way, and yet the difficulties they face as painters in dealing with what is in front of their eyes turn out to be rather similar. Perlstein once put it like this. When I decided to become a realist painter, I determined that every mark I put down on the canvas would come from my actual visual experience. And I soon learned the technical difficulties tr of trying to make each mark be a metaphor for the light on the forms, textures, and space in front of me. I found that the greatest difficulty lay in getting those metaphors of forms to break the picture plane, to get the forms to look as though they existed with measurable distance from each other, with a sense of air around them. When I stare at the scene I am painting, the distance between the forms assumes a kind of profundity, and it seems very important to capture them accurately. These spatial relationships seem to characterize the basic life experience of potential movement. I suggest that it is the honesty of the attempt to recreate the forms and spaces visually without artistic editing that is one of the hallmarks of realist painting. That uh, artistic editing he talks about is, is everything that, uh, that Lewitt, in his own way, also wanted to eliminate from his art. There's a somewhat more recent one of Perlstein's paintings. In general, he's best known for figure paintings, portraits at times, but most especially these setups, sometimes extremely elaborate, with anonymous models, who are in fact referred to in the painting's titles simply as model or models. Modeling is a form of work. It's a job, and what Perlstein depicts are people doing a job. And as with many forms of work, though perhaps this is becoming less true in the era of what's been called affective labor, the job description does not call for the manifestation of any particular personality, sensibility, or interiority. But concomitantly, Perlstein paints like a man doing the, a job, and equally without evidencing his personality, sensibility, or interiority, at least not directly. That's what's so impressive about his work. It's cool stare. There's something about his unflattering way of inscribing the flesh of his subjects that can remind you of the gaze embodied in the photographs of his almost exact contemporary, Richard Avedon. But unlike Perlstein, Avedon isn't really cool. He's cult, by which I mean that his gaze is penetrating. He can be aggressive toward his subjects. Unlike Perlstein, he is observing them socially, morally, politically, or at least trying to. He wants to penetrate beneath the skin, whereas when Perlstein looks at his models, he's really interested in the skin, but interested in it as if it were not exactly skin, but simply surface. A generation younger than Perlstein, who's now 90 years old, the British-born painter Raxtraw Downs has, since the 1970s, been making meticulously painted essentially documentary renderings of the American landscape, and generally not the prettiest parts of it. This is the industrialized landscape, the worked landscape, 
sometimes desolate. Like Perlstein, Downs paints exclusively in the presence of his subject matter. However, the paintings clearly emphasize that the scene they depict can never have been seen all at once in this manner. Their extreme horizontal formats mean that the painting always presents simultaneously things that could never have been seen simultaneously. This is the paradox of representation that seems to fascinate Downs. The fact that our mental synthesis of our visual impressions makes a picture out of sense data that could never have been registered all at once. Since our eyes, our head, our body are all constantly in motion as we take in the view of the landscape and scan the horizon. The picture is a fiction that shows something that could never have been seen otherwise. And it is this artifice that he wants to make apparent. There is always a sense of distortion, subtle or sometimes not so subtle, to his paintings, not unlike Perlstein in that. And yet, paradoxically, for all the intricacy of the artifice that he constructs, there is a kind of plainness to how he constructs it, that is, to, to the way that he puts down the paint to show what he depicts. Downs once said that technique is a skill that you learn so you don't have to respond to what you're looking at, so you don't have to be inquisitive about it. I can imagine Giacometti nodding in agreement with this indictment of technique. And yet, of course, I don't have to tell you uh, that in fact there's plenty of technique in Downs' paintings, but he's always putting a damper on it in order to try to keep his responses fresh and full of questions about what he's looking at rather than just solutions to the question of how to render it. There have been other painters working from direct empirical observation, uh, obviously, besides Perlstein and Downs, of course. Um, but for me, at least, until recently, those two have been pretty much the only ones whose work uh, I found really interesting in the long run. There may be others, but I don't know them. I know, for instance, that there's a group of realist painters in Madrid that some people think highly of. Uh, their chef de col is uh, Antonio Lopez Garcia, who, like Downs, is now in his 70s. But I haven't seen enough of Lopez's work to judge it properly. And what I have seen has left me somewhat skeptical. And so these couple of uh, interesting realists, these devotees of observational painting, have seemed to me to be very much isolated figures, somewhat outside of the mainstream of painting. And the way I've described this mainstream to myself has been to say not that modern and contemporary painting is essentially abstract, because that's not necessarily uh, the case in my view, uh, but rather that it is not representational. The way I put it to myself is that modern painting renders an image rather than a representation. What do I mean by this distinction between representation and image? It's not actually my invention, that distinction, but something I found in Pierre Schneider's great book on, on Matisse, where he says, representation looks back to something, recalls a model. An image invents a presence. He also says, to construct through color is to make an image. To destroy through color is to undo representation. Schneider, in turn, attributes his special sense of the word image to Kandinsky. He used it in this way in describing the art of Cezanne, but who added, the same intention actuates the work of one of the greatest of the young Frenchmen, Henri Matisse. He paints images, and the images endeavor to reproduce the divine. So following Schneider, following Kandinsky, when I say representation, I'm talking about something intended to reconstruct the appearance of a model. And when I say image, I'm talking about something that uh, attempts, that uh, attenuates the connection to the model. For Gauguin, for Matisse, for Giacometti, it seemed possible to start from the model and rather than representing it, to produce an image that would have a comparable impact. Matisse once explained, the driving force that leads me through the execution of a portrait depends on the initial shock of contemplating a face. One might say that the image conveys the shock rather than the face. 
For painters who paint from memory and imagination and forego the model altogether, not to mention those who paint abstractly, the disproportion between model and image that so perturbed Giacometti uh, or Perlstein is, of course, no longer an issue. But the significant 20th century painters who continue to want to make representation rather than images, as I've said, have been, in my view, rather few. I've named a couple of them, and undoubtedly there are others. Some people might cite Balthus, though I'm not really so sure. I suspect he may have been uh, more like Matisse, more a painter of images disguised as a painter of representations. And then, after what I have to admit has been many years of resistance to his work on my part, uh, I've come to be more interested lately in the German painter Peter Dreyer, who is a bit younger than Perlstein and a few years older than Downs, and who has been working on his series day by day since 1972, amounting to by now some 5,000 paintings of an empty water glass painted from life, if life is the right word for an empty water glass, and still going strong. All the more reason then that I've been surprised to notice in recent years in the new millennium, the emergence of several striking young talents whose project is representation from the directly observed object. You probably won't be surprised to hear that among them is Victoria Gitman, whose work you've presumably already seen in the amazing show of hers uh, here at the Paris Museum. But she's not the only one. And it's interesting, although I don't have any particular explanation for this, that many of them, unlike the artists I've had occasion to mention so far, are women. This evening, I want to talk about two, two of them, Ellen Altfest and Josephine Halverson, along with Gitman. Altfest seems to alternate between being a studio painter, like Pearlstein, and a plein air painter, like Downs. Her first New York show in 2002 was called Rocks and Trees, and the works in it were all painted outdoors, while her second show, Still Lifes, in 2005, featured natural objects that had been brought into the studio space, nature brought into the space of artifice. Subsequent, subsequently, she also introduced the human figure into her re repertoire of studio motifs, always, so far at least, the male nude. Now, since I've uh, already compared Outfest to both Perlstein and Downs, I have to point out that at least in one respect, her paintings are very different from theirs. Think back to Downs' landscapes with their almost impossibly panoramic views, which seem to take in a wider context than natural human vision could ever encompass. They're not just landscapes, they're mega or meta landscapes. It's you, if you switch from that to one of Outfest's outdoor paintings, well, you realize that although we don't have any other traditional term than landscape for what she's painting here, in reality, such a painting hardly fits into the um, usual definition of landscape, and even etymologically, it departs from the sense of the word, which according to one etymological dictionary uh, goes back to circa 1600, painting representing natural scenery from Dutch landschap, from Middle Dutch landscap, region, from land plus scap, condition. Originally introduced as a painter's term, Old English had cognate, landscape, and compare similarly formed Old High German landscap, German Landschaft, Old Nordic landscaper, meaning tract of land with its distinguishing, char meaning ca tract of land with its distinguishing characteristics is from 1886. So if the scape, part of landscape, ret refers to the condition or distinguishing characteristics of the land, well, Altfest leaves out the scape. She edits out the context to an almost ruthless degree, showing us not place, not even really the objects of nature, animate or inanimate, uh, but their texture, their surfaces, one almost might say their matter. As Downs shows us the world in an almost impossibly extensive way, Altfest shows us the world in an almost impossibly microscopic manner. And while you wouldn't say that Perlstein ever seeks the breadth of view that Downs conjures in his paintings, and one is always aware in Perlstein's work of the enclosing plane of the studio, the walls, the floor that box in the room's temporary inhabitants, placing them in a sealed off quasi-laboratory environment, 
Still, that sealed off environment is an environment and the, and, and the viewer is always aware of its human inhabitants as being in relation to it and to each other. In Altfest's figure paintings, the situation is quite different. One never sees a few full, of, few, full view of a body and, and it can barely be said that one even sees a whole body part. Although in contrast to Perlstein's recurrent use of the word model in his title, she always names these paintings after body parts, torso, the leg, arm and side, and so on. Where are they and whose are they? We're not shown. With some of Altfest's studio still lifes, we glimpse just enough of the studio environment, just enough and no more, to experience a sense of irony in the fact that a natural object has been conveyed here where it does not belong. That is, in the fact that it has been decontextualized. A good example would be the 2005 painting, Tumbleweed. Although it is much more than that, I can also see this painting as a kind of joke about the relation between this kind of close focus, textur texturally oriented realism and a certain kind of abstract painting that might otherwise seem its polar opposite. Here's my favorite Jackson Pollock painting, uh, Lucifer from his uh, his breakthrough poured painting from 1947, and I hope you can see the connection. Even the way that Pollock mostly kept his intricately messed gestures within the canvas is echoed by the way that Altfest tumbleweed sits inside the rectangle. Like Downs as well, Josephine Halverson paints her subject on site rather than as Altfest sometimes does, bringing them into her studio. But like Altfest, she paints things from close up often from a distance of about arm's length. And therefore, her very process edits out any view of the thing's larger context. And yet there is a sense of atmosphere to these paintings that alludes to the context without defining it. Halverson, whose first important shows took place in New York in, 19, in 2009, once told an interviewer, I make better art when I have to yield to the often unpredictable conditions that painting on site presents. I've come to think of my practice as a collaboration between me, my materials, and the world, where the painting becomes a testament to time spent together. So it's not so much a thing as the conditions in which the thing is encountered that become the painting's subject. And Halverson's sense of yielding to the conditions in which a thing is found is the opposite of Perlstein's laboratory-like control over the studio environment. Her idea that the painting is a testament to time a beautifully resonant phrase is especially important because I think that for all the painters I've discussed this evening, with the possible exception of Gauguin, but certainly for all of them from Matisse onward, one of the great problems of pictorial representation is the problem of time. Specifically, the problem of the seemingly trivial and self-evident fact that it takes far more time to paint a painting, to construct an image or a representation, than it does to see it and to recognize it and enjoy it. As viewers, we can take a painting in in a moment. We see it as a painting and we see what it is a painting of in a kind of all at once way, even though of course we can also spend a great deal of time appreciating it, its depth and its nuances. And since we can take it in in a moment, it is natural to imagine that the painting represents a moment and indeed, this was the fiction that was cultivated by classical European representation, that the painting could represent, for instance, the very moment in which St. Matthew experienced his calling, or the very moment in which Icarus tumbled into the sea, or the very moment in which Jean-Paul Marat expired in his bathtub, having just been stabbed to death by Charlotte Corday. And the same kind of fiction was still cultivated by the Impressionists when they endeavored to depict a given landscape at a specific time of day in specific weather conditions. Maybe Halverson is not so far from the Impressionists. There is a self-consistency to her representations in the way they register time and what she calls conditions. Simply put, even though her atmospheric but unshowy workmanlike facture seems to to slow down the act of viewing and invite the viewer to give time back to the painting, one never feels that the prevailing conditions are different in one part of the painting than another. 
She, does, she doesn't reel the changes of mind and changes of viewpoint in the flow of time that a Matisse or a Giacometti allow for, nor the multiplicity of viewpoints assumed by a, a painter like Downs, nor even the intensely persistent quality of Altfest's mark making, which has its own way of seeming to count time. How long does Halverson work on a painting? My understanding is though that although there may be a good deal of preparation involved, she tries to paint a painting in a single session. This is something she has in common with painters as different as Alex Katz or Luke Toymans. But a single session can be a long time, all day, or in any case, still much longer than the time anyone but the painter herself is likely to spend with the piece at a single viewing. In fact, Halverson has mentioned putting in a 20-hour day on one painting. And so there is a time pressure involved in such a modus operandi. It calls for stamina. So even in a one-session painting, a sense of time conditions the way it is made and the way it appears. Yet somehow, that time has collapsed. It becomes spatial. Halverson seems to suggest an equation between the object quality of the painting and the object quality of the thing being painted. For this reason, she often chooses plainer things, do doors, walls, and so on, not unlike 19th century trompe l'oeil painters, such as William Harnett or John F. Pito, although she never does indulge in trying to fool the eye. Gitman's paintings have been connected with the idea of fetishism, understandably. As with many of Altfest's paintings, they make the viewer immediately conscious of the intensity of effort, both observational and uh, manual, involved in their making. No painting one of these in a day. And they have often been linked to the trompe l'oeil tradition, perhaps less aptly than in uh, Halverson's case, since they have a way of undermining their own illusions. One reviewer of Gitman's early depictions of costume jewelry noted that these paintings seem to have an accusatory, pretension-stripping attitude. We know that the diamonds, amethysts, and silver of the bracelets and the chokers are really glass, plastic, and stainless steel. Set against the implacably sober earth tone backgrounds, the fake jewelry projected the de deadpan defiance characteristic of mugshots. Well said, but it's even more complicated than that. I don't think that Gitman's art sets its face against fiction or illusion, or even against downright fakery. And not only because her recurrent choice of subject matter that is in itself somehow imitation or faux or kitschy suggests a genuine attraction to these things and not at all an attitude of condemnation. It would be really masochistic, in fact, to exert the kind of time and effort and above all of attention on these objects did one not have some kind of affection for them. But also because of the evident fact that her paintings of these objects are themselves counterfeits or fakes of a sort. After all, a diamond made of oil paint is no more a real diamond than one made of glass. Still, it's a curious coincidence that just as uh, Chase Madar, the Art News reviewer I quoted a minute ago, was put in mind of a mugshot, a couple of years later, the Los Angeles Times critic, Leah Ullman, was reminded of a forensic or judiciary context by Gitman's paintings although her metaphor was slightly different. In describing Gitman's way of rendering her objects, which were always placed unambiguously front and center, Ullman wrote, Gitman speaks plainly as if presenting evidence. Blunt statements. As dazzling as her paintings can be, there is also a down-to-earth factual directness about them that feels like it has something to do with constituting a testimony of some sort. For Madar, the testimony was accusatory, but while I agree that Gitman is always playing the game of breaking down an illusion in order to construct her own illusion, still, I think that for the most part, Gitman is a witness for the defense, and that, as Ullman puts it, all of her paintings have something of the homage about them. Similar to Altfest in this, and perhaps to an even a greater extent, Gitman has mastered the very difficult task of reconciling the minute textural rendering of surfaces with the sense that the surface is somehow more than just a surface, but is in itself a whole world full of space and air. 
The seductiveness of the paintings is not equivalent to the attractiveness of the objects they depict. The paintings transform one's sense of space in that they somehow allow one to see at a level of detail that could only be attained by holding the object extremely close to one, one's eye, while at the same time showing the whole object at a rather neutral distance, arm's length as with Halverson. The, this two-sided sense of space corresponds to a two-sided sense of time. With all three of these contemporary observational painters, we can see that there is a constant direct reference and challenge to abstraction as a major mode of modern painting. I've already mentioned Altfest's solution to Pollock and the recourse to planarity and geometry in Halverson's work evokes all sorts of modernist abstraction from uh, Mondrian through Agnes Barton. Gitman too shows her awareness of geometrical abstraction. In an understated rejoinder to Clement, Clement Greenberg, she finds the avant-garde in kitsch and kitsch in the avant-garde but the painting itself is neither one. Maybe what avant-garde and kitsch have in common is the fiction that time can be overcome. In kitsch, by sentimentally looking backward toward an idealized, if not totally fictitious past, and with the avant-garde by projecting the self out beyond the present to some unknown realm of the future. By putting its energy into an empirical examination of a manufactured object, Gitman's art reconfigures the ambiguities of representation in a remarkably understated way. Out of the fundamental temporal problem of representational painting, the evocation of the moment through a process that involves temporal duration, she evokes an original sense of the extended present. Gauguin would not have believed it. We dream in front of the object just by observing it as it is. Thanks. Do, do, do we do uh, questions here? OK, uh, we do questions here. So, Uh-oh. Uh, when I was trying to, um, when I saw your description of what you'd be talking about tonight, I was thinking about you know, who you might be talking about in terms of contemporary painters, and uh, those are two of the people that um, you know, I obviously feel a connection to, so I'm mm -hmm. very glad to hear that you brought them up. But you just mentioned in passing that you know, we happen to be all women. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the case of uh, Ellen Altfest, I think the, the scale of what we do is also uh, kind of similar. So I was thinking, I mean, do you see any, any significance or, uh, to the fact that you know, we are all approaching representation this way as women or artists, or is, is that anything? Um, I, I think, I, I mean, I was really quite honest in saying that it was clearly very noticeable to me, but I don't, don't know what to make of it. And I, personally, I feel very uh, hesitant to try and, and come to some bigger conclusion. I mean, obviously, for all that I, point out some commonalities that you have and that you're all uh, people who are really um, in an extraordinary way uh, reclaiming something that I think was for a long time marginal in modernism. Otherwise, your, your works are so different. Your subject matter is different. Uh, most evidently in Halverson's clay, uh, case, the technique of painting is so uh, different. So. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Maybe you have a, a, a speculation. Thanks for coming. <laughs>